I will never tell anyone how much I'm worth because my accountant doesn't want me to. This guy immediately confronts me on whether I'm really a millionaire. I mean, what a joke. This guy came at me hard, wanting to get me to expose the UK government and Jordan Peterson. But then as the interview goes on, we talk about the best businesses to be in and how to really make money. Let's do this. Question number one. Are you a millionaire? Yes. How much are you worth? Why would I answer that? Well, I want to know. I think everyone that's watching this wants to know. Uh, I don't think m that many people care about how much money I've made. I want to know. So my wife... What do you roughly think you're worth? I know what I'm worth. I've just done tax return for this year as well and paid a lot of tax. Oh, that's one of my questions, actually. We'll, yeah. we'll come back to that. How did you make your first million? Well, I haven't answered your first question yet. Well, I feel like you was going to give me a politician's answer. Nah. So my wife, my business partner, my accountant said, never tell anyone how much you're worth. And I think that's good advice. I can tell you this. There's someone who apparently researched me on my YouTube channel and said my net worth is 70,000. I've made more than that in about three months on YouTube, so that's wrong. But there's also someone who said I'm worth a quarter of a billion. That's also wrong. You never really know what someone's worth. I can tell you it's you a lot more than no 10, a, a lot more than 10, and a lot less than a billion. More and that's all you're getting. More than 20 That's all million? you're getting, because otherwise the wife and the business partner will be on the case. What are you worth? I reckon... I north of 20 million up to 40 million now somewhere in between that level you reckon but you don't know i know don't what know I, I know what i'm worth to the nearest 3 million the, i've the, just finished the, a, i've just finished a 100 unit apartment block minimum 20 million pounds 8 million equity 1.3 to 1.5 million in income and that's just my last deal probably do 2 million this month so there you go, there's a bit for you, but I will never tell anyone how much I'm worth because my accountant doesn't want me to. Okay. And my business partner and my wife. Okay. How many properties do you own? Dunno, probably 1,540 tenants. Because here's the thing, one of my properties could have one tenant in it and my biggest one's got 159 tenants in it. So it's actually, the question I would have asked is how many units do you own? And for me, I count a unit as a tenant. I know we're in Peterborough at the moment, and if I took you around some of them, I could walk 100 yards and I'd show you a, a property I own with 42 tenants in it, one next door with 26 tenants in it, one about 15 metres away with 159 tenants in it, and one across the road that we're just developing with 45 tenants in it. And they're all very different in size. 1,540 tenants at the moment. Do you track your rent roll each month? Yeah. Do you know the answer to that? So, well, my business partner, you know this, but, but they may not, but I have a business partner and he manages the real estate property side and I manage the training business and the brand side. So he has a spreadsheet on it. He sends me it every six months. We had a good look at it the last couple of weeks because we just finished this big project. So our total rent roll is probably just nearing three million pounds. A month? No, a year. A year. Yeah, yeah. In terms of our properties, we have a managing company as well the, so big, the, the biggest own, agency. you're bringing in three million a year doing that why do you do all the other business stuff because that's a that's a you know after your mortgages and debt and services you can make some yeah, we're quite cash we're, we're quite low on the loan to value we're not one of these you know 85 90 percent loan to values because we do a lot of commercial you can't be yeah yeah. because if you go over the covenants you know they can ask yeah. for the money back so we're our average loan to value is pretty low. So obviously we've got quite good equity in that portfolio as well. I don't know if Mark would be happy with me saying how much, but definitely worth more than 35 million and some. But I'd have to check with him for the full figures. Do you want to buy more? Well, we're currently developing 42 units, an apartment block. At, they're calling it, they call it one of the two gateway properties in our city. So we're finishing that off. It's been quite, because it's pretty hard to develop when you go through COVID. Mm. You know, you can imagine trades, Prices have gone through the roof big time. I think, I mean, I'm only 43 and I've been doing this for 15 years and we've got 1,540 tenants. So by the time I'm 53, 63, 73 or 83, could have 5,000 tenants. But you have to think about a few things. Number one, you have to think about exposure and you can have too much of something. So, you know, you wouldn't want too much residential in the town centre or you wouldn't want too much commercial in the town centre because you can get exposed. Mark said to me a few years ago, I think we've got enough residential now, we should get some commercial. And he said to me, uh, uh, finishing this project, I think we've probably for now got enough commercial. So he's, pr he's now probably gonna start looking into, I don't know, industrial or agricultural or land or full development, because we do conversion. Because I think it's really important not to be too exposed. And then your question about why you, do you do all the other things? Well, um, most people who like cars, wouldn't just stop at owning one car. I've got a collection of supercars because I like cars. So I always find it, Really interesting when people say, well, if you make so much money out of property, why would you do training? 
Well, because at one point we, would, we did 21 million in revenue in training. Why would yeah, I not? I get it. Yeah. I get it. No, no, I'm not saying it's the wrong or right answer. Yeah. I'm just thinking about the people that are I like, watching this. I, I think it's important to have multiple streams of income as yeah, well. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. How profitable is your business? Um, depends which one you're asking me about. So, so we've got this property business, we've got training business. Is there something outside of those two spheres? Um, we have seven different companies, management company, that's really profitable. That's like an estate agent. Letting agent. agent. Letting agent. So that, I would say, is probably, that one is like probably 30% net. Um, the training business is probably more like 15% net. We've got a lot of staff up there. Yeah, I've seen. There's 90, a big overhead. 90 here. odd. And ads are really expensive at the moment. I'd, I'd, I've never been able to keep the training net profit margin because a lot of people oh you get into training sell a few courses massive margin really yeah, easy yeah, you know yeah. some of the flyby nights in our industry they've bought three properties and then they think they can be a big guru trainer they don't realize it's quite a lot of moving parts of that business so to scale it anyway so that net margin is because we've had covid for two years actually our net margin went up a lot in covid because yeah. we didn't have any overhead for yeah, okay. um hotels and stuff but probably 15 20 percent on that one net just thinking about this, I've got a better question for you. If you had a million quid to invest and I said to you, you couldn't do it into property and you couldn't do it into a training business, what sector would you like to invest that money in to get the best return on investment? Is there anything that you think, oh yeah, I'd like to have a go at that? Well, I'd never put one million all into one place. I think that's stupid. So I can't do real estate and I can't do training. I mean, I'd definitely max out my ISA and do my, um, yep. you know, sort of stock market I, division. Specifically, though, because, you know, you help a lot of entrepreneurs and I think a lot of people come to me and go, oh, what do you think about this idea of business, that idea of business? And so people ask me that all the time. And I imagine you get that question as well, like, this is my business plan, what do you think, Rob? Is there anything that you'll think, oh, yeah, that, that's something good that I should maybe put some time, effort and energy into in the future? Not that I would advise because I get asked that question a lot as well, but why would you do something different if what you've done really worked? Yeah, I get that. You know, my friend Neville Wright, he sold Kitty Care for 75 million, and someone said, oh, what would you do different if you started again? And he went, I sold Kitty Care for 75 million, why would I do anything different? So actually, I'd probably say an information type business. Yeah. Because information, no stock, don't need premises. You can do it on a laptop or a phone, really low overhead. You can set it up real quick. You can turn what you know into cash flow, your ideas into income. So I'm a big fan of that kind of business. And what Progressive has done, you know, you've seen the training business over the years come and go and people come and make a big noise and then go bust and in and out. But We've been a mainstay for 15 years because we've got into different types of information, e-commerce, public speaking, property, joint ventures, etc. Yeah. So I like the information. It's a low risk, high speed business. I'm not advising this, but I am really fascinated on NFTs and metaverse. But I would never say I'm going to put a million into that or recommend anyone put a million into that. But I've just soft pre-launched uh, an NFT series, my NFT series, and it's gone really well. I haven't even launched it yet. I've sold more than half of them. I haven't even launched it. So that's a really fascinating space because I think can see a world where virtually anything that used to be a piece of paper or some um, glitchy app could be an NFT. What about brick and mortar businesses? You ever thought, yeah, I'd like to own a hotel or a car rental business? Anything that's traditional in the eyes of the viewer that you might think, oh, yeah, I'd like to... I think I could make a difference in that space with the knowledge that I've got. I think a lot of this is about timing, depending on when people watch this. But if they're watching this the day we recorded it, bit freaking risky to go yeah. and buy a hotel when, I can tell you this for a fact, a lot of people are not leaving their house. Yeah. We, we've got an event in there. We'd normally have 200 people in an event. Yeah. We've got 21, 22. People are not leaving their house. The world has changed. They've got used to Zoom. I think you've got to be pretty fucking crazy right now to build a big gym or a hotel or, or, or a restaurant or a chain of restaurants because I think the world is uncertain. But if that business has been hit, that could then bring an opportunity because often opportunities come when things have been wiped out. There's a lot of empty real estate. That real estate is cheap, um, depending on the area. Here's another thing, James. Like, I know my limitations. I've never run a restaurant. Yeah, no, that, and I think that's yeah. a smart answer. That, that's, I'm not trying to trip you up here, but they're, they're, these are entrepreneurs and business owners that have got staff and trade that watch my stuff. And I think that's a smart thing to say. I'm not in that space. I don't know. And that's why I like to ask people. And I think a lot of people wouldn't answer it the way you did. How much tax did you pay last year? A lot. We more pay, than a million? Yeah. More, more than that in the last four and what the, months. When you talk about that tax, are you talking about corporation tax, personal tax? I'm not talking about turnover taxes, VAT, I mean profit taxes. Here. Well, I am 
I am not in the game of drawing all of my profits right now. Yeah, Why do I want to pay 45% income tax? So um, most of it is, well, corp, a lot of corp. Of course, I mean, you say I'm not going to count that, but do you know what? Entrepreneurs don't get the credit. We generate all that revenue. No, I get and, that. And no, all no. the business rates no, we I, generate. Yeah. I hate turnover taxes. You know, yeah. you know I, I, I think I pay considering more than anyone else I actually know. You know, I own a lot of leisure businesses. Mm. How do you, you, know, you, you had Nigel Farage on your channel the other day, and he came to our ice cream factory the other week, and I asked him this question I'd like to ask you now. If you're the UK government, I believe the UK is full of great entrepreneurial people. The facts are... Who are getting suppressed right now. Yeah, absolutely. 50% of them fail within two years, 80% within five years. 5% of businesses get to their 10-year anniversary. It's a horrific set of facts, and they're absolutely factually true. Now, I don't think it's because people have got the will. I think one of the problems is they don't actually understand. They don't know how many beans make five. Watching people like you and hopefully myself and others, like they can pick up stuff, but a lot of people don't actually discover us. And that's a real shame. Huge news, years in the making. My brand new book that my publishers refuse to publish, Money Matrix. Beat the money system and build generational wealth. Understand the three main ways that the banks productize you and make money from you. You'll be able to turn that system against itself, build generational wealth and multiple streams of recurring income. It's all at moneymatrix.cash. And if you're quick, the first few hundred registrants and buyers will receive many special bonuses from me. The brand new Money Maker Summit three day special event. Meet me at a champagne reception. Meet me at a multi millionaire networking dinner. Go now, moneymatrix.cash. This is huge. But what would you do if you was in UK government that you think could really help business owners get past that magic five years? I'm very fucking clear on this. Good. The first thing I would do is if I was in government is I would get mentorship and advice from people who've run big proper businesses. They're yeah. not being advised by the no. right people. That's number one. Number two, I'd stop hating on or looking my nose down on entrepreneurs because I spoke to Nigel Farage and he said they just don't respect entrepreneurs yeah. in, in government. That, that's, you know, that it's not the Etonian way. So number one, I'd go and find all the biggest entrepreneurs in the UK and I'd give them some kind of bonus, reward, incentive or reason to come and advise the government and start yeah. learning about business. Because it is also a fact that the public sector is financed by the private sector absolutely. almost entirely, yeah. yet they are biting the hand that feeds them. Yep, yeah, absolutely. Um, so number one, get proper advice. Number Number two, stop looking down on entrepreneurs and business owners. Number three, incentives, tax breaks, subsidies to start and grow a business. Yeah. What I think they're, they're doing wrong is they're seeing the way of paying their debt and generating their revenue by taxing us yeah. instead of encouraging and incentivizing us to turn over more. Yeah. Because surely it'd be better if they got a smaller share of a much larger economy. Yeah. yeah. But they're actually suppressing the economy. What, what draws me insane, I don't know if you feel like this, the UK could be like the world leader for entrepreneurship. People trust our legal system. They, we've got, whether you like the banks or not, we've got some of the most trusted biggest banks in the world on our doorstep. The we've Queen, got, the universities. Yeah, yeah, got, yeah, all of that. And I just feel like we just don't Basically, I mean, America is just the fucking same. They're all leaving a lot of the yeah. states. So, I mean, you know, in America, they have federal and state taxes. At least we joke. don't, you know, we don't have double tax. But yeah, like in the last recession, they got rid of that. Well, no, they, I think it went down from 20 to 15 and then maybe to 12 and a half. I can't remember, yeah. but they reduced. Why yeah. have they not reduced that? Not only have they not reduced corp tax, they've put it up. That's really And they didn't bad, just yeah. put it up. They they freaking nearly doubled it. No, I know, um, I know. National insurance has gone up 12, yeah. 12 and a half percent. Income tax, inheritance, you name it. Yeah. It's insane. And if they're not careful, they are, they are well, they're, they're not just buying the hand that feeds them, they're buying the freaking arms off. Well, the, the problem is the world's a smaller place, you know, especially the next generation. Them going off to Australia, they just do it like that. Like 30 years ago, that was a big or should we go on a plane and go somewhere? People just do that like that. They're off to yeah. Singapore. Do you know what? Don't if, care. If they, uh, I reckon all in, turnover, profit, and what what I buy, I reckon I'm about 70 pence in the pound I pay in tax all in. Yeah, I, I figured it out. Yeah, yeah, well, I've if that, 64 if that, is what I agree. Okay. So I, I reckon you're so, 70 So if, I, if that goes to 75, I'll consider leaving this country yeah, that I was yeah. born in. Stupid. Absolutely <laughs> stupid. Let's talk about debt now, because you've obviously, you're doing these commercial conversions, you've done loads of property stuff, and, you know, if you're an entrepreneur, you've got to get used to, if you, especially if you want to grow, at some point you're going to have to take investors, bank debt, and stuff like that. You've definitely borrowed money. Yeah. Millions? Yeah. Tens of millions? Yeah. 
20, 30, 40, 50 plus million over your career? Well, the last one we did, we borrowed 12 million just right. on one deal, so yeah. I like debt, good debt that makes money, but a lot of people have a real problem with it. Yeah. What's your relationship with debt like? Well, Dave Ramsey says all debt is bad, and he's wrong. I'm just gonna say it, he yeah. is wrong. Not all debt is bad. Yeah, I agree. Um, this, this building I'm in that houses over 100 people yeah. has some debt on it, mortgage. Yeah. But I'm not gonna be too loose with my language because if you don't understand debt now how to manage debt, and if you start over gearing yourself, then it becomes bad. Yeah. So it's not just that there's good debt and bad debt, which there is. You have to understand what good debt is and how to properly leverage good debt and not turn good debt into bad debt. So gearing, you know, we talked about that before. I don't like my gearing over 60%. If it gets under 50, I think there's some wastage there. Yeah, you yeah. can good. refinance and reinvest. So I like my gearing to be 50 to 60%, but we've got covenants on some of our commercial. If we go under a certain gearing ratio, they'll call the money back in. Back in the last recession, I knew the um, the guy who owned Meadow Hall and he had three billions worth of debt on shopping centers like Meadow Hall. Yeah. And, and the banks in the last recession, they just called in, it was in the billions because it, the, his property values went down. In residential, mm -hmm. if your property values go down, doesn't matter. Yeah, yeah. But in commercial, they'll call yeah, oh, the difference absolutely, back. Absolutely, yeah, absolutely. So um, a good loan, I was gonna say low loan to value, no, a good loan to value, whatever the banks are comfortable with, I'd go 10 to 15% below that. Yeah. So, you know, when the banks are comfortable at 85, I'll go 70. When the yeah. banks are comfortable at 70, I'll go 55, yeah, 60. Got it, got it. Aside to that question, and I really want to ask about interest rates. What's the highest interest rate that you've paid on a loan for a business transaction? 1% a month. So that's 12% APR. Yeah, but it's, it's private that finance. Would, yeah, people would really like, oh my private, God. That's private finance, that's yeah. not bank finance. And you have, would you carry on doing that? Well, we bought this building, which is 6,000 square foot. It's, pro it's worth just under a mil now, and we paid 495 for it. And we paid 9% over nine months and refinanced out. So as long as 1% a month is short term, it has to be short term. Yeah. I mean, I know people who pay 3% a month short term, yeah. but when you've got the in and out fees, it ends up 4% yeah, a month. Yeah, for sure, so yeah. long-term debt, I mean, right now, you can get long-term loans in the under 2%. But I mean, that's unsustainable, but if you can fix it for five years, you're all right. So obviously it depends on the interest rate at the time. For years, people have been asking me where I buy my watches. Many of you may know I'm a watch collector, I'm a watch investor, and those as an asset class have done me very well in the last 15 years. I have never shared where I source my watches from or my watch dealer until now. My watch dealer used to be a professional footballer for Manchester United, and he formed a watch brand called Broadwalk. And he sources the higher end brands like Rolex, Oda, my Piguet, Patek Philippe and Richard Mille. I trust him, I've used him for many years and recently we've done a partnership. Hence, I'm inviting you, if you want to start investing in watches and protect your money from the banks and inflation, to check out Broadwalk. That's B-R-O-A-D-W-A-L-K. And the website is broadwalkgroup.com. The email is sales at broadwalkgroup.com. And please don't share this, but his number is 07496 eight seven eight one five three obviously only message him if you're serious about buying and investing in the higher end watches people have been asking me for years and for the first time ever you can get access to my watch dealer so, so are you constantly looking to borrow money to put to work or well, you and Mark, you know, your business partner, you're like, yeah, we can get a million here, let's just borrow it and put it to work. Or do you, you're always looking to get your funds in place before you put it to work, or do you find the opportunity, then go and get the money? So we're always looking for opportunities, and we're always moving money around the place, whether it's ours, and we've got a, um, a few private investors. Mark's a bit different to me, and my business partner, and he, he takes responsibility very seriously which is good, he would much rather use his own money. Because then yeah. if it goes wrong, well, it only goes wrong with us. For me, I did my first 50 property investments all with other people's money before I even put any of my own in, which was profit from no money down deals. So I have a slightly different view. Yes, you want to put money to work for sure, because inflation is high, cost of living is really high, the return on cash is really low. So right now, Cash is probably losing 10% a year, and it might be more. You don't want cash for very long. You know, I'm, I know Grant Cardone, I'm friends with him, and he keeps going on about how cash is trash. Well, when there's COVID or a lockdown or a recession, cash is not trash. No, so no. that is too one-sided, that. So you need liquidity for irregularity, short-term issues. So, you know, I, I would like to have a few million liquid always. You know, you probably want a ratio of your net worth to be liquid. That, mm. And by liquid, I mean a week. Yeah. Not a month. I've got some assets and I thought they were liquid, but actually it's three months. That's not liquid because when yeah. a market goes the wrong way, 
three months can be 30% down. So I do like to have some unlevered um, access to money, but I'll put it in watches and cars and other things like that. I mean, what, cars aren't really liquid. Rolexes are very liquid. Stock market, like I said. Let's talk about business partners. I don't have any business partners. I think you're I missing out then. I don't have private investors. I've never borrowed money from a, a private individual other than in vendor finance when I've bought businesses over a period of time. And I slightly think that's different. How do you find those people that lend you money privately? A family or business connections? We've borrowed from Mark's family, then my family, but incrementally and once we'd shown a bit of no. streetwiseness yeah. and proof, yeah. yeah. We've borrowed from people who've attended our courses or connections that, yeah. that we've known, but we've only got a small handful of private investors. You don't need a lot. In fact, yeah. dealing with a lot of private investors is a freaking nightmare. It's like yeah, having yeah. a load of kids, so you don't want too many of them. So that's quite a small inner circle. We've met them at uh, property network meetings or business type events. I, I know you're a big fan of going to business events, and I, I am too, masterminds, things like that. In the modern times, obviously, you can meet people online. I think having a business partner is great. By the way, you chose the right person to interview, because the first two questions, he'd have just told you to fuck off and get out of here. You really bastard. Yeah. I remember when I asked Robin Sharma, what's your net worth? He was very upset. <laughs> like, I mean, I don't care. I have no problem mm. answering those questions, but you chose the right person yeah. to interview because he's private. He'll watch this and he'll go, Rob, let's have a chat about this. <laughs> <You know? laughs> We've done nearly 200 mil in revenue yeah, amazing, in the yeah. training business, but I wouldn't have been able to do that if he wasn't doing all the real estate. But I, I mean, I've spoken with lots of business owners. Lots of partnerships don't work. Why does yours work? Because you're very pro it, aren't you? Mm. And I've seen him on stuff, and he's very pro it mm. as well. Why does yours work when most don't? Why do most people never get to black belt? Why do most people never make professional grade football? This is the thing. A lot of people think that something's a scam. I mean, that's not what you're saying. I'm going off on, ta on a tangent, but they think things are a scam because most people fail. You know, you said the, the, um, the ratio is about starting a business. But how many white belts ever get to black belt? It'd be the same. Yeah. So in life... So I know why I think you've been successful. I, it's a different mm, way than what yeah. I think so you're so, so the reason most people fail in partnerships is because most things fail. Like naturally yeah. and organically, yeah, that yeah. is the way the world works. The reason our partnership has been good, and I'll give you a few tips now. Number one is... You have to be in partnership, I believe, with someone with a different set of skills, but a that's, similar vision. That's exactly why. And that is really, yeah. different skills, similar vision. If yeah. you've got different skills, but a different vision, in the yeah. end, you're going to go like that. Yeah. If you've got similar vision, but the same skills, you're just going to get in each other's yeah, way. Absolutely. And I, we didn't even know that. You, yeah. We learned that on the journey. So that was luck, really, you met each other. You didn't yeah, I mean, it, I suppose it depends yeah. how you define luck. If he was the 72nd person I met, is that luck? Because I went to a networking event and gave everyone a crappy, cheapy Vista print business card and stayed till the end end when, you know those networking events when it's just dead and the cleaners come in right yeah, at the yeah, end. Well, yeah. I stayed there and I ended up meeting him. So, yeah, it was, I do believe that some good fortune can come your way, but I do believe you can go out and hunt that good fortune. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I did that. The next thing, why did our partnership work? I have so many people that come to me with partnerships and they, they're like, oh, James, he's not doing this, he's not doing that. He's supposed to do this in the partnership, he's not delivering. Too many people go, you're not delivering, instead of, how can I be a good partner? And you know there's that famous saying, be the change you want to see in the world. I want to be a great business part partner to Mark. I don't want Mark to answer to me. And, you know, yes, I want him to be accountable. Probably both of us in the first six to 12 months were sort of like, what are you up to then? Because you should be doing that. And what are you up to then? Because you should, you, should, you should be doing that. That's the wrong way to have a partnership. Like if I'm in a partnership with you, I trust you. And um, if there are issues, I'm going to take responsibility for it and try and make sure that I'm a good business partner to you. Because if I'm a good business partner to you, you're going to want to be a good business partner mm. to me. It's a very different perception. Like your kids, when your kids are upset, you can either go, you little shit, or you can go, there must be something beneath this behaviour yeah. that's, yeah. Uh, you know, and my wife's brilliant at that. Whenever I'm upset with the kids, she's like, well, they're just kids and this, you mm. know, he's probably got s something up with him or probably something going on at school. I've learned with people, because I have a lot of staff, if there's ever an issue with them, there's usually something going on in their life. If you find out what that is and you're sensitive to that and you can help them with that, you're- They'll shine elsewhere. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's not nicely brings us on to employees. How many have you got? Our, our peak across contractors on the building sites, um, VAs and outsourcers and in-house was nearly 250. I would say at the moment we've probably got 150 across those. 
So let's talk about the PAYE ones that are really, you know, akin to you, that they, they need you, they're paid every month. How do you find your superstars and what do you do to look after those employees and keep them motivated and becoming profit centres for the business? Okay, so there's some recruitment companies and consultants that are really good, probably 10% of them. So you probably got to find, I, I, I'm not... I'm not particularly pro recruitment consultants because I think there's a slight misalignment of interest. But when you there are good ones in your town or city, and you shouldn't dismiss just because their fees are, are really high. That could be a good business to get in when we come out of this recruitment because their fees are fucking madness. Yeah, yeah, I, 20, 25%. Yeah, I, fee. They make a lot of money. Ah! It's, but it's very stressful. Oh, I'm not I'm not saying it's wrong. They start from zero each month. Yeah. So they're always, they never get ahead of themselves. Yeah. My, my other half as a recruiter. Yeah. Really stressful. But you see the ups the, and downs. You, you, um, you do get good salespeople out of recruitment yeah. companies. Yeah. Yeah. So um, recruiting people from recruitment companies. Actually, when people answer this question, I kind of feel a bit disappointed. Don't judge it, just listen. But actually, a great source of our great staff are our great staff who recommend people to us. Yeah, absolutely. So what, so what we do, but if you, if you don't ask them to refer and then pay them to refer, they don't refer. Yeah. But if you go out there, so for example, there's not many videographers in Peterborough, but there's a couple of shopping channels, Ideal, Ideal World, you might have heard of that. I've got a couple of people who came from Ideal World and I was just like, who's good, who's good? And you just stay on them. Yeah, yeah. And then, do you know you can get 500 quid? Yeah, yeah. Huh? Oh, but, you know, yeah, yeah. so your good staff. So you're using your staff to bring in people and you'll know if you're good a good fit for you. Yeah, yeah so yeah, yeah. exactly. So you, um, your good staff is a good source. Indeed works really well for us for certain so If your types. staff are going to watch this, if they haven't been asked, they know that you don't think they're good. <laughs> You're going to have to go and ask everyone. Now, now, maybe we just don't have a vacancy (laughs) in that department before you throw me under Uh, the bus. For certain roles, Indeed has been good. For others, not. For certain roles, Upwork has been good. For others, not. So there's five sources for you. What about recruiting within? Do you love pushing your team to go up within the business or do you prefer to bring leadership from outside? In an ideal world, you would... Terry Leahy and Tesco stacking the shelves all the way up to the, the you know, yeah, the, yeah, the, yeah. The, 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 the top dog in an ideal world. Those people are rare. I'm not attached to either because I know there's a plus or a minus. That's um, a good answer. And I'll tell you why, just real quick. Someone who's good in a role, as soon as you move them into management, they've got no management experience. Yeah. And they're good technically. And then their next um, promotion is management, but then they're in the deep end. Yeah. So sometimes I want management experience. Sometimes yeah. I want the technical. What do you think is the best traits for winning in business as an entrepreneur? Good artists copy, great artists steal. I think the best trait of an entrepreneur is to nick all the best bits of everyone and then put your own unique sprinkle on it. Yeah. So Rage Against the Machine, I don't know if you're into that kind of music, um, no. but rock, metal and hip hop hybrid. Sounds horrific. Okay. I'm so you must have heard of- Frank Sinatra yeah. guy, uh, But you must have heard of Dave Grohl. No. <laughs> Drummer of Nirvana. No, no? Well, I know Nirvana. Okay, right. Yeah. Dave Grohl said, I shamelessly ripped off soul music when I made my drum riff in the, their most yeah, famous yeah, yeah, song. Yeah. Hip hop was brought over from Jamaica. Um, hip, oh, hip, hip hop singers used to just be announcers, MCs. So if you look at any niche or industry, they have evolved and they are hybrids of different things yeah, all yeah. merged together. Yeah. And I, I've got an artist background. I used to be an artist. So for the first couple of years in business, I had this snooty, well, I have to be so unique and original yeah. you, on, the, on the one side. And then on the other side, you have people that just rip off. Yeah. And I think you've got to do the middle. So I would love to learn the best bits about what you know. And yeah. I would love to not do the things that didn't work for you. Yeah. And the same for everybody else that I can meet and talk to. Yeah. Because why invent, reinvent the wheel? Stand on the shoulders of giants. Model the traits of the greats. What's your management style? How do you manage the 150 people that work in this building? My management style isn't necessarily the right style, but it's my style. And my style is to give people energy, excitement, enthusiasm, inspiration and vision yeah. and let them crack the fuck on. And then keep a little bit of an eye on them every now and again. Uh, and if they repeatedly make mistakes, I'll, I am quite a forgiving manager. Yeah because I think we're all human. Yeah. And I think if you support people when they're struggling, I think that could be good. Yeah. But if it's too much, I'll then come in and just cut it. People don't communicate enough, I believe. You know, I like to know what's going on. Yeah, you've got a lot of people here. Do you like the people you work with? As in as mates? Yeah, do you like your team? Yeah, I love my team. Yeah, me and, too. And I walk in and I feel really freaking proud. Yeah, that's like, good. Unless you're an entrepreneur and you hire a load of staff, you don't get 
what good you're doing in the world yeah. and you know how much money you're generating an economy mm. you know when all these people on twitter oh you know must a grifter doesn't pay any tax doesn't you know they don't fucking understand oh, yeah, they just know. and they've never had a business but every single one of those staffs generating all this tax and all this revenue and yeah, all absolutely. so you have to be careful not to get too close to your staff and i've definitely done that before you know i used to go down the gym with a couple of them and i'm a bit of i can i'm a bit soft sometimes and if you get too close they don't take your mm. instructions seriously and, and, and they'll start, they won't even do it consciously. Oh, well, yeah. that won't matter because Rob's cool, we're mates, it won't matter. Yeah. So you do have to have that line. You've interviewed some big names on your YouTube channel and podcasts and stuff. Who's the most inspirational one out of all of them that you've met for business owners and entrepreneurs? I would say this isn't the most inspirational person I've met or I've interviewed, because like you said, I've interviewed a load, like hundreds, loads of billionaires, but probably Jordan Peterson. And I'll tell you why, because he sent the world on fire a few years ago and really divided people between, you know, good on you, Jordan, for speaking your mind and standing up for free speech, you know, I'm with you. And then, of course, a lot of the people who are professional getting offended. I just, I, you know, for a living, I'm just offended by everything. They all hated him and he went on quite a dark personal journey of yeah. exploding yeah, and fantastic. it really affected his mental health as well and I'm relatively close to their team um, and we have our second interview coming up this summer when he comes over he's been he's been very he's put himself in some very vulnerable positions mainstream media and you know and his illnesses and battles that he's gone through but the interview we did with him is one of the highest viewed Jordan Peterson videos ever and he's had loads tens of thousands of comments of people going this is the best Jordan Peterson interview we've ever seen because yeah. we talked about selling and marketing and business not just about personal pronouns and non-binary so what, what did he say that you thought was well, go and watch the video I will go and yeah. watch the video everyone else I mean, go and watch we're the video bit, Chad's who makes all my videos big fan of well I, I'll give you one thing he said and people don't get this and we discuss this in detail but the risks entrepreneurs take and we put everything on the line. How the um, instrument of a limited company is a genius design and invention of humanity that people don't give credit for. Because if your liability wasn't limited and you had to put your mortgage and everything on the line, you would consider not doing it. But the limited company vehicle of limiting the liability if a business goes to the, the business and not everything that you own, that is a genius financial structure which gives us a bit of protection to take the risk. And a lot of people don't understand the entrepreneurial risk. So we had a big chat about that. Because mm. I actually think the, the limited company, the LLP, the LLC, it's a really smart rapper. It's a really, mm. there's a lot of things that have been invented by humanity. People don't understand how genius it is. Um, but they bitch and moan about it. Oh, well, a, a business owner could just wind up a company and start another one. Well, no, it's not as easy as that. And your reputation's gone to shit and all this. Yeah, absolutely. But we wouldn't take a fucking risk if we had to put the house on the line every time. Have you put your house on the line for your business? No, that would be fucking stupid. I've done it many times. I think it's stupid. Have you personally guaranteed anything? Yeah, loads. Oh, yeah. But not the house. Well, yeah, it is similar. I, I, I know that there's layers on my PGs and it's not going to get to my house. Yeah. And by the way, my wife would never let me. Yeah. <laughs> what about your wife? Is she interested in the business? Yeah. She's a shareholder in two of them. Does she want to know what you're up to? If you borrow 10 million quid for it, does she care? No, but yeah. She got more interested when COVID happened. Yeah. Um, we were burning a shitload of cash. And for everyone that says cash is trash, if we didn't have millions in the bank, then we wouldn't have been able to keep this training business going. So cash is not trash. But she was interested then. Over the last couple of years, we've got much more involved in our personal finances. She invests in our crypto. She sets up all the wallets. She manages it all. And I like her being involved. I, I, I want her to know everything. I think accountability is important. If I'm thinking, you know, I, I said, putting your house on the line is stupid. But what I will do is I'll sit on your seat and go, putting on the house on the line gives you accountability to not fail. Yeah, yeah, uh, and, and, you know, my wife being involved in everything gives me accountability to that, you know, that relationship to make it work. And I think it's good. So, yeah, she's much more interested now. What are you like as a person, though, right? Are you, are you an introvert? Are you an extrovert? You know, you, you seem quite extroverted here. And I think a lot of people would say that of me. But I, I, I like being on my own just as much as I like being with lots of people. Yeah, I, um, I spend more of my day on my own and I love it. I get up at 6 a.m. and start work. No, I get up at 5.30 a.m. and start work at 6 a.m. every day. And I work on my own until 9 a.m. And I love that time. And that's one of my favourite parts of the day. I was the fattest kid in school. And I grew up with a lot of baggage having that. Well, in the year at school for about three years and I had a lot of rejection and I felt very unloved, unvalued, unrespected, unadmired on the outside all the time. 
And so that created a big neediness in me to be noticed, admired, loved, respected, etc. So that's why I've been able to turn on this extroverted thing, get the world record for the longest public speech, you know, be pretty out there on socials because it's like uh, I want to be noticed, loved, respected and admired. Do you have a lot of friends? No, no. Everyone who knows me knows I don't have many mates. Do you drink? Virtually none. Yeah. I actually quit drinking when I started um, my proper business in 2006. It was one of the best things I ever did. Yeah, I used to get two-day hangovers. What about, I've been studying entrepreneurs and business owners more now than ever. 35% of self-made millionaires in the UK are dyslexic. There's loads of super successful people that have elements of autism, ADHD, dyslexia, all of these things. Lab they're just labels, by the way. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, yeah. I appreciate that. But I actually feel quite motivated that the world is now looking at that going, actually, they're, they're, they're lucky. Well, they for me, that's some... just common sense. Yeah. Like, people think that that's weird. I got an A star in religious studies, and I told that to my son yesterday, and he laughed at me. He said, you're not religious? And I said, no, I just read St. John's. You know, you got, we got a little book, it was yeah. St. John's, and just read it and memorised it. But, your... but that doesn't make me a good entrepreneur. No, Reading no. and memorising shit doesn't make me a good entrepreneur. What makes me a good entrepreneur is being the fat kid in school and not being noticed and having yeah. to find a way to get noticed or being dyslexic and getting board rubbers oh, thrown at you. No, 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 but a lot of them, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. so my friend Neville Wright is wildly dyslexic and the teacher used to throw the board rubber at yeah, him. Yeah. And he couldn't see letters, but he could yeah. see numbers. And he would go and sell on the, you know, in the playground. So if you've got all these labels, and this is really fucking important for me to say this. Don't own that fucking label that someone else put on you. Own who you are. And every upside has a downside and every downside has an upside. So what's yeah. the upside of dyslexia? You're probably good with numbers. You're probably good at selling. But if you read St. John's and got an A star, that makes you a terrible salesperson. Yeah, yeah. You know, sure. to sell, you have to take rejection. Yeah. And you don't need to write well or articulate well. What's your number one skill set for your business? Like, what do you do? Seeing the future. So I'm the person out of all of them that can see... A clear future better than anyone else. What's your worst trait? What do you do that is so bad that someone else has to do it for you? All general admin. All general admin. It's a if I went and asked mess. your team here, would they all agree with that? Oh, they definitely agree on the admin side of it. Yeah. So I, it's, it's I, I think they, 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 they so would... I think that is most entrepreneurs. That's why I'm asking these questions. They would perceive my... Um, changing my mind a lot. Yeah. They, some of them would be frustrated by that, but I actually think it's a strength to change yeah, your mind. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Can you have your mind changed by yeah. your team? Yeah, oh, 100%. If I can't, I'm a, a fucking idiot. So many, look, the people that I've met, this is all super successful people. It all aligns. You want someone to like do a survey on successful millionaires and you will see. So what about subject changing in conversations? Do you do that? Well, you've done it more than I have this one because I haven't still been, I'm still on a couple of your last answers. I'm a bit OCD yeah. like that and I'm yeah. thinking there's seven questions we half answered. Yeah. So I try not to do that. I'm quite a linear thinker, so I yeah. get frustrated on that. And I seem to attract a lot of people in my life that change conversation a lot. So I've got to learn to do that. No, I find that frustrating. I'll let you be the judge of whether you thought he was too aggressive or I was a bit defensive. Hey, look, I've got nothing to prove. My results speak for themselves. But please let me know what you think in the comments.